welcome and thank you for coming. My name is Dave Goodwin. I'm the Director of Planning and Economic Development for the City of St. Petersburg. And uh, we want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come here on an evening and, and join us as we, as we kick off in earnest the process to develop our very first overall master plan for our wonderful downtown waterfront. Uh, I want to say a couple of things. Uh, the city staff who worked so hard to uh, set this up. Uh, Sharon Wright, are you here? Derek Kilborn, and there are several other city staff members. If you'd raise your hand, there's a lot of work involved in putting this together, and, and, and they're all to thank for doing that. Okay, there's a map that shows the study area of our downtown waterfront. It goes from 30th Avenue North at Northeast Exchange Coffee Pot Park, all the way to 22nd Avenue South, which encompasses Lassing Park, and everything in between. Uh, we have a long history of of planning in St. Petersburg that started 100 years ago with a plan for this waterfront. Our forefathers saved this, uh, had a plan to save the, the waterfront park system and it started from there. We had a great plan from John Nolan in the 20s. We had our conceptual plan in the 70s. We had our new comprehensive plan in 1989. We did Vision 2020 and many of you in this room, I think, participated in that about, about 14 years ago. Uh, we've got a lot of neighborhood plans, corridor plans, redevelopment plans port plan, airport plan, marina plan, but we've never had a plan, an overall plan for our downtown waterfront. So in that sense, uh, this is a historic uh, effort. And we have to thank for that, of course, our Charter Review Commission who put it on the ballot and to our voters who uh, approved that uh, by referendum just a couple of years ago. One thing I want to, before we get into, before I bring up Dr. Dr. Tom Malone, I want to talk about the pier and the downtown waterfront plan. We've got a couple of big projects going on right now at the same time. And I hear a lot, well, how can, are, are, how can they be going on at the same time? Isn't that going to create some kind of train wreck? No, it's not. The, these two projects, uh, they're very complementary. Uh, they're integrated. Uh, they're integrated in terms of staff involved, in terms of public involvement, in terms of sharing information. Uh, so they're, they're very much timed very well, and I would say the, the current schedule for the pier, we'll kind of know by the end of this year what the conceptual design for that pier may be. We'll go into some formal processes to get to begin formal design toward the first of this uh, of, of 2015. Now that's right before we'll have kind of the draft master plan come out, and we already know from our our pier working group, kind of the program of activities. Uh, that will go on at that pier. So we've got a lot of information already to share uh, going each way to both of those projects. So I think the timing is excellent and that'll work out very well. Um, now what I'd like to do uh, is introduce to you uh, Dr. Kanika Tomlin, our Deputy Mayor. started out the day in a coat and all buttoned up, but it's too late for all that now. So, good evening. How are you? I bring you four words, four fleeting words, but I hope that they'll stick with you throughout the course of this process. Now is the time. It is a very important time in our city's history. We are determining things that not only dictate quality of life for us and our children, but even the children yet to be born after that. And so we are so glad that you're here. We thank you for being here, I ask you to remain engaged, I ask you to fill this room with your friends and neighbors in a way that we have to find another place to meet because now is definitely the time. In the mayor's office, we have many great days, lots of smiles and sunshine and our shared service to the city. Our reality is comprised of any number of wonderful reasons to come to work. You know it's a great time in this city. We're truly a city on the move. But no call to action gives us greater joy and affirmation of our representative purpose than those exercises that collectively call on the engagement, collaboration, and input of our entire community. The Downtown Waterfront Master Plan does just that. Thank you for lending your voice, your time, and most importantly, your passion 
to the perpetuation of one of our most precious assets. We're fortunate that our city enjoys a long history of successful stewardship. People who have looked out for the common good and greater interests not only of themselves, but for all who might come to call this community home. Then, now, and in the future. It's so important that our progress happens with purpose, according to a plan that is the will of the people who call this community home. More than a century ago, our city's forefathers had the vision and foresight to protect and preserve our waterfront so that we may experience today what they experienced then. Pristine park-like settings that serve to connect our community in many wonderful ways. If you think of our city as a home that we all share, our individual neighborhoods might serve as our bedrooms. Our beautiful waterfront park then would be our living room. The great restaurants of Beach Drive, our dining rooms, the walking trails of North Shore, our patio, and Lassing Park, our lawn. These are the shared spaces that connect us, the common areas that call us together, and their beauty truly sets us apart. Man, what a view. As you know, this is a very special resource we are considering. Many of you know my husband has been the outdoors editor for the Tampa Bay Times for more than a quarter century. In that role, he's traversed all of the waterways of our fabulous state. He's been down every river and up every creek, with and without a paddle, literally. <laughs> and hands down, our waterfront is his favorite place to boat, his favorite place to paddle, and that is the sentiment of people who enjoy the outdoors throughout our state and in many places in our country. There's no place more beautiful, no place more plentiful. Tampa Bay is the largest estuary in Florida. St. Petersburg serves as the gateway to the Gulf of Mexico and as an entry point to Tampa Bay. Anyone accessing those waters off our coastline is experiencing our waterfront. What happens here and how it happens matters. Your continued engagement is key. Our community is the primary source of what goes into this plan to ensure that the outcome is a guide that transcends administrations, economic highs and lows, trends, and time. Count on this being an accessible, inclusive, and transparent process. Many tools will help make it so. The planning process will, of course, include traditional methods such as community meetings like this one, but it will also honor our value for innovation and add walking audits and technological platforms for feedback into the mix. Our forefathers made sure our waterfront, as we know it, was a reality. And now it's our turn to write the next chapter of our waterfront's history. We need your voice. We need your input. We are authoring your plan for our waterfront. So little of this important work is about today, really. It's not even about the next five or 10 years. This is the work of a generation. This is the planning that determines quality of life in our community for many, many years to come. So thank you for being involved. Now is definitely the time to determine tomorrow. The mayor, who regretfully cannot be here today due to an obligation with his family, and believe me, it's the only cause that would cause him to not be here, is spending lots of time working with our city council, our team, and strategizing about our waterfront and leading our city toward its best future. He shares some of his thoughts and those from others in our community in a video about this process. So let's take a look at that now. Thank you for being here. This place is so uncluttered and, uh, you know, uh, the city has done such a great job about maintaining that and preserving it. It's just, it, it makes it, it makes it great. You can fish, you can bring your kids here, you can, and, and show them, you know, just how beautiful the city is. You just have so many opportunities to go out and 
from paddleboarding, uh, you have opportunities to see many different types of animals that live out um, in the sea that are all the time come into the bay. When you have water on one side and also that incredible energy from the city that you get on another side creates something so magic that truly helps me to carry the positive thoughts and creative energy throughout the day. It's so beautiful here, so soothing. I can always come here when I just want to relax and just have nice scenery to view. The water is such an integral part of St. Petersburg. I couldn't imagine a USF St. Petersburg that wasn't connected to the water. I spend a lot of time with my family, uh, having like romantic strolls with my husband or uh, walks with my son. Picnics in the park. Picnics in the park. Birthday parties in the park. We used to have birthday parties and we'd bring like a kayak or a canoe, so it was more than just a birthday party. The waterfront here in St. Pete, there's nothing like it. Here at the waterfront, it truly showcases the St. Petersburg and the great energy that exists in St. Petersburg in the best possible way. It's just beautiful. I mean, beautiful. It, it's beautiful. And I can't say it enough. It's beautiful. The downtown waterfront is one of the main reasons the sun shines here. It's a unique asset and sets the tone for a vibrant downtown St. Petersburg. It didn't happen by accident. A century ago, our city's most forward-thinking leaders worked tirelessly to assemble the stretch of publicly owned land. Now it's our turn. The decisions we make today will shape our downtown waterfront for generations to come. Developing this master plan will require our collective vision, civic spirit, and insight. It will require you. We invite you to participate as we embark upon this process. There will be public meetings, walking tours along the waterfront, and focus groups. We will offer new opportunities online through our new Mind Mixer platform, St. Petersburg Innovision. Our forefathers and mothers entrusted us with this waterfront, and now we must do what's right for our children and future generations. Let's make the most of this opportunity. Please join us in participating. Thank you, Dr. Tomlin and Mayor, and Mayor Kreisman. Wasn't that nice? Really set the tone, didn't it? Um, so, now we're about advancing our work. So what are we gonna do? What is our mission? What are we trying to accomplish? We're gonna look at that water, so much going on. A spectacular piece of urban real estate and natural beauty. More than 100 years in the making, where the water meets the land, where this community shares so much. The mission is to create a comprehensive master plan for the downtown waterfront, an overarching plan that preserves and enhances St. Petersburg's signature waterfront for future generations. That's really it in a nutshell what we're trying to do here. Now we've already done some work in that regard and I want to go over that with you real quickly. We had, some pro we had some input, we had a big meeting down on the waterfront about a year ago on the campus of USF St. Pete, in fact. And, and we, 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 we had 240 attendees, we had a table exercise, we took individual surveys, and I wanna give you some of the highlights of that meeting and what came out of it, and they probably won't surprise you. Key values we heard, open space and vistas, cultural amenities, public access, events and tourism, dining and shopping, we also heard about some challenges that we must meet. Broken connectivity, peer redevelopment. We all know about that. Too much parking on the waterfront. Reconfiguring Al Lang Field. 64% of the folks that answered the survey said reconfiguring Al Lang Field was something most important. Some key ideas. Diversity of transportation and connectivity. More options to access the water and more market activity and opportunities. Now on your brochure that you have, right here, everybody should have that. It's a key piece of information you all need to take it home with you. There are web links to this survey so you can look at it for yourself and see everything that's on there. We also brought in the, U, the, the Urban Land Institute, ULI, to, to help us understand the opportunities and, and to gain some new perspective. 
Now let's think about the context of that. These folks uh, come into town, they're here for a week, we give them some background information, they interview some folks, uh, they lay out, uh, in, one e in one week, they lay out a plan that they think are some of the highlights of what we should be focusing on. And again, um, that's candid review from experts, it meant to start an open dialogue, and it's advisory only, just more information that goes into the process for us to help understand what our issues are, what our opportunities are going forward. Some of the key, uh, key topics they brought up. Preserve and enhance the environmental edge of our urban waterfront. Improve our water quality. More pop-up retail and events. Enhance our streets. Convertible streets was a, a word they used. More pedestrian friendly. Reconfigure large events. More transient boat dockage. Diversify our transportation options. Bike share and bike facilities. Increase connectivity along and to the water. Expand public art and museum opportunities. Redevelop and reconfigure Al Lang Field. Develop the Innovation District, which means USF St. Pete, uh, All Children's Hospital, John Hopkins, the Bayfront area, and our Marine, our Marine Science District. And leverage our current and new community partners, which means we need more folks to join in the effort to help improve our waterfront. More organizations, more resources to help us implement whatever comes out of this plan. And again, in your, in your folder, there's a web link to that ULI report, and you can, uh, at your leisure, look at it in detail. All right. So how do we advance the mission of creating that vision and plan together? A plan that will give the community these four things. A framework of guiding ideas and principles, documented programmatic desires, design concepts, and planning intent. An implementation plan, including funding and partnerships. How do we get there? Well, of course, we do it as a community. To help us, we have an outstanding consulting team. After an extensive and competitive process, which included many nationally recognized consulting firms, and that's because this project was very, uh, very exciting to uh, outside firms to work on. Um, St. Peter's got that kind of buzz. These big consulting firms want to be here. They want to be part of it. We had one that really stood out. That's the AECOM team. They have the depth, depth of experience that this project needs, and they have great local connections. They were involved in the Central Avenue Tomorrow Plan and the Vision 2020 Plan and the recent redesign of the Mirror Lake. So they know St. Pete, too. They're international, but they're also local. But really, what really won the day for the AECOM team, and I, I, was, I sat in on selection meetings and presentations, was their very well-articulated project approach. And again, as Dr. Tomlin mentioned, lots of community engagement many options or, and platforms for that engagement. And they're going to tell you more about that as we go forward. So it, it is my pleasure to turn over the mic to Mike Brown. He's the project manager for Team AECOM. Thank you all for coming tonight. As Dave mentioned, uh, my name is Mike Brown. I'm a landscape architect with AECOM, and I'm a project manager, and also the project manager uh, for this project. And I want to talk to you guys just for a few minutes about our new relationship with your community and, and what that'll look like now and for the next eight or nine months as we develop the, the plan. Um, we, we realize that you guys are the knowledge base, so we, we find great value in that. So we will be coming to you and, and extracting as much value and as much knowledge from you guys as we physically can. Um, you know more about your own city than we do. We understand that. Um, we have set up a lot of different opportunities for us to be engaged with you folks. It's very important for us to sit at the tables with, with you and understand your concerns and your needs for this great city. Um, this is something that we have developed over time and it, it, it's become a proven um, positive result in, in many of our other projects. Uh, so we will work, be working together back and forth, but understand that when, we, when our project is done in eight or nine months, it's not an AECOM plan, it's, it's your plan. And we want, we want you to understand that it, at the end of the day, it's not an AECOM thing by any means. So we're here to help, 
We're here to facilitate, and we're here also to bring value to you guys. We have a, a team of, of experts in engineering and planning, and, and a, a great deep understanding of, of the different types of environments like your downtown waterfront. And we're gonna bring those team members to you and, and, and really work with you folks to, to develop the best plan that we can. Our team also understands that, that you, guys need to under, you guys need to understand that what we do. So like I just said, we're gonna be coming to you, these different experts will come to you and sit at the tables and pick your brains about what you know from your city. And here's just a few of the different disciplines that we'll, we'll bring in order for us to, to gain as much value from you folks during these meetings. And we also understand that you've done this before. So we want to leverage all the information that you guys have developed in prior planning processes and use that as a springboard for this planning project. We don't want to start over and we don't want to drag you through all the, all the stuff that you've already been through. We want to use it and capitalize on it. And we also want you guys to understand that this project will be different than the others. It'll be different in a way that it's an actionable project. It won't sit on a shelf and we'll, we'll, we'll strategize and identify certain projects within the plan for, for future implementation and funding opportunities as well. So it's really important for you to understand that this isn't just a plan, but it's a plan that will live on and provide a framework for future development. So next, I would like to introduce Pete Seckler. He's with our team. He's an urban planner, and he's going to be talking to you folks tonight about the, the program this evening and about how you guys can be engaged and participate in the planning process. Thank you. Good evening. My job is to get off the stage as quickly as possible so that you can... <laughs> <laughs> so that you can hear from some, I think, some really, really uh, interesting um, experts about world-class waterfront cities and, and, and world-class park planning. And then we do have an exercise for you tonight. Um, in order for me to get off the stage, there's a couple of quick messages that I want to um, share with you that I think will make this process unique um, in terms of how we're approaching it. Um, and specifically, it deals with community participation. So I want to I want to quickly summarize sort of our, our our basic approach to the project and how we're going to use community participation, and then we'll get on with um, I think some inspirational images and then an exercise um, for you to close the evening out. Um, the first thing to understand is that we're thinking of the project in sort of two parts. Um, there's there's really understanding what is going on and getting as many data points on that as we can by talking to people, doing technical due diligence, um, and and then co coalescing that into some clear frameworks or planning principles that we can then vet with you and say to you, did we hear you correctly? Have we defined the issues and opportunities for St. Petersburg correctly? Um, and we really want to do that in this and the remainder of this calendar year, such that when we get to early 2015, we can take what we've learned and what we have agreed upon as a group are really the, the key kind of guiding ideas and really important things that need to be built into a plan. And then we can start working on those things and delineating what does that mean in terms of a design result, or a financial opportunity in terms of how you might fund something or, or some other mechanism that we might put into the plan in order to achieve your desired outcome. So that's kind of how the plan works. Now, in order to do that, we have to be able to talk a lot, and that's hard. So we want to use a lot of different techniques. We want to do a whole series of things online, and we invite you to um, look at the online materials, but we're also going to do a lot of things in person, face to face in terms of meetings, workshops together, design charrettes. We're going to do virtually all of our design here in St. Pete with opening and closing presentations when we do a big design week so everyone can see the work. I want to focus in on a couple of things. Um, these two websites, if you go to the city's website, you know that there's the drop down button for the waterfront master plan. You should bookmark that website and we'll have it up for you later. 
That's the website where we are going to consistently give you schedules and information about what's going on with the plan. The other website is, in my mind, a little more interesting. The other website is, a, is called a mind mixer site. And this is www.stpeinnovision.com. This is a site that you can all log into. If you go there right now on your smartphone, it'll pop right up. It's ready to go. It's live. And this is where we can host all sorts of online dialogue and input photography that you might take about something in your neck of the woods um, that you want to make a comment on. You can, you can take that photo, immediately key it to a location in the city. Other people can see it and comment about it. We have specific questions on there and surveys on there that we want you to take. So the Mind Mixer site, I think we'll, you'll find it to be a very interesting um, platform. The other thing that we're going to do on this project that may be a little bit um, new to some of you anyway is um, a, a form of community meeting that we call a walking audit. And um, it's in the brochure and you will be able to go to the website and see the schedule for when and where we're going to hold these. What we want to do is we want to take sort of the conventional, you know, two hour, two to three hour community meeting about a specific area and we want to break it up into two pieces. The first piece, and let's say, let's say we're here in area, area let's say area two. Um, we want to take a period of time and actually meet on site at a specific time and walk a specific route and talk and learn about the things that we see and evaluate the things that we see. Then we're going to take a little break so that we can reconvene in a community in a community room type of setting and conduct a public meeting. Now, you don't have to do the walking audit to do the public meeting at the end. And um, if you want to do the walking audit but not participate in the public meeting, so you could you could do one or the other or both, and that's perfectly okay. We want to have this opportunity, though, to, to really walk these sites with the people that are directly interested in these sub-areas and talk in a very detailed way about what's going on. So if you, if you follow the schedule that's both in your um, program and on the website, if you're interested in having a more detailed look into one of these areas and really walking the territory with us, um, we invite you to do that. Um, what I want to say, just sort of leading into Vaughn Davies, is we recognize that this is going to be a complex plan. We have some very different areas from south to north. We have neighborhoods and sort of the Lassing Park sort of environment, community gardens, people fishing. We have a very complex and very interesting sort of working waterfront and innovation district. Um, we have your fabulous downtown. Um, we've got the recreational things north of downtown and then the very quiet sort of neighborhood trail sort of condition um, to the north as you head up to the coffee pot area. So we recognize that we have to be very diverse and nimble and we have to be able to balance a lot of competing interests on this master plan and that's our job is to figure out how to filter all those things and, 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 and help articulate the right path forward so that St. Pete can continue to be a premier waterfront. So with that, I'm going to introduce Vaughn Davies. Vaughn um, is AECOM's um, Global Director of Waterfront Master Planning. He has literally worked all over the world, including Australia. Um, he's based out of San Francisco, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about waterfront cities. Thank you very much, Pete. Thank you, everybody, for having us here. It's truly a delight to be in this enchanting and kind of sometimes mesmerizing town, city. I don't know if you like to be called a town or a city, but um, it's been a joy getting to know the little that I do know of your, your place. Um, we're really going to be starting a conversation with you about what makes a great waterfront. You are a great waterfront, and we want to make sure that the legacy uh, continues for successive generations, but in order to do that, we need to often refresh things, look back at things in the past that were successful and maybe disappeared, and we want them back, and look to the future as much as that as well. So there are a couple of things I want to kind of think about as we go forward, some of the attributes that make great waterfronts and great places. Um, 
the first and foremost differentiator for you, which a lot of people forget, because sometimes we wear a developer hat and we're thinking about everything on the land, but really the unique thing is access to the waterfront and the water itself. So we want to make sure we always have that in the forefront of our minds is to maximize that access. We're also looking to uh, create waterfront serving uses, and by that we mean things that are unique to a waterfront. And also, again, it sounds so obvious sometimes, but we're not designing uh, a new office building that can be on a piece of land anywhere. We're designing buildings that relate to the waterfront. Waterfront restaurants, waterfront cafes, promenades, new beaches, uh, boat ramps, boat docks, etc. So I think you've got to kind of maybe we all need to get out in the water and not just do the walking tours, but do a boating tour. But to think about the water's edge. And we need to remain, remember the authenticity of this place. We don't want you to be like any other city in the world. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to discover what is truly authentic today and maintain that authenticity, or even maybe elaborate on that authenticity. But we truly want to be a great St. Pete at the end of this, not a great something else. Um, and a key part of that is we're designing for locals first. It's, a real, it's the reason you're here, because Great places that we visit all over the world are only successful because the locals love them. So if you visit New York, the great places are places New Yorkers love. If you visit London, they are great places Londoners enjoy. If you come to St. Pete, it needs to be the great places that St. Pete occupies at Tuesday morning for coffee or on Saturday night for an event. So we want to really make sure that you guys love it and embrace it and you're the advocates for making this a continue being a great place. We're looking at it in two ways. We're looking at sort of the larger linkages. So even though we've been told to draw on the green piece that you looked at, the waterfront, a lot of the success of the waterfront is the success of the backland, the upland area. So we want to make sure that we're not doing anything on the waterfront that doesn't lead to success elsewhere. So those linkages back inland are just as important as the linkages uh, to the waterfront for us. Great diversity, very different neighborhoods. They should all express themselves very differently on the waterfront. We don't want to be the same from top to toe. Uh, there could be lots of great, wonderful places along the way. And then as we zoom in, um, we want to think about the access on to the water, what's on the water, as I mentioned earlier, and this sort of broken, fragmented series of parks that you see illustrated by these green spaces that we think have an opportunity to all really read together as one and read as a great park city. Some are on the waterfront and some are inland, um, but we think stringing them all together would be a wonderful opportunity for your city. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about developing a water plan, and this goes back to the idea that we're not inland somewhere, we're at the water's edge and everything needs to have a purpose and a meaning about the waterfront. So we'll talk a little bit about what a water plan means. And it means just as much about developing what's in the North Basin or the Central Basin uh, etc., and, and starting to program that with uses that you can access. Oftentimes they're given over to uses that, quite frankly, we don't really understand, and they're secured and they're gated. We want to try and open that up a little bit and be much more part of that story. So, as we kind of move forward into this, we're going to acknowledge the fact that there are lots of other ongoing projects. Some of them may come to fruition before our plan comes to fruition. We shouldn't hesitate to borrow their success and claim their success as part of the city's success. We're not separate projects, as you heard. The city is all over these and understands all of these, and we want all of you to be aware of those. So this, a success anywhere in the city needs to be a great success for the waterfront. We want to be that tied into and tuned into what's happening as we move forward and make them all great successes. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of some stories here, really, with using some other examples. And as I said earlier, we're, these are not to, to be what St. Peter's about, but every great waterfront has a great story about how it got there. So I'm going to share a few of these with you very quickly, because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, but they all have a great backstory, And the measure of success is different for every single one of them. This is a waterfront that I worked on 20 years ago. And the great, one of the great measures of success is that Cape Tonians love this waterfront. They take every single visit to, the city to see this, and they are tirelessly being great ambassadors of this waterfront. But financially and economically, too, it has been a huge boom for the city. There has been a brand new hotel built in Cape Town, not on the waterfront, every year for 20 years. That would be a huge measure of success if you could see benefits upland from the waterfront that are piggybacking on the great success of the waterfront. So we want to make it something that is a benefit for the whole city. 
The other good thing about this image is that waterfronts by their nature are a little bit messy. There are parts of them that are really authentic. They're working waterfronts. They're where you repair your boat, where you drag your stuff out of the ocean, where you bring your fish to the edge and you clean it and uh, buy a new tackle and get on the boat, whatever they are. But that messy nature of a waterfront is something we want to keep. We do not want a tidied up, spick and span waterfront like anywhere else in the world. The authenticity is really, really important. So whatever those activities are in the water that use the water need to register themselves on the land in some way. And I think that's kind of the cool reason why we go to the waterfront. Kids love going to see the boats, who's working on the boats, whether it's a fire boat or a police boat or a great yacht or a new motor boat or somebody fishing. It's that authenticity and that messiness that we want to make sure is still uniquely St. Pete as we move forward. This is another waterfront that I have had the opportunity to work on. It's a project that many members of our team worked on a long time ago, and we're still working on the waterfront. And that means that it's, it's been a success because it outlined a very clear framework and a path forward 15 years ago, and we're still working on it. We're implementing it. We're taking it to the next generation. This waterfront, which at face value looks like just a really cool, great playground for a region, um, is going to be the host to the Commonwealth Games in 2016. And in order for it to survive through that huge event, we're having to go back and look at all the details and make sure it's going to be sustainable and it can uh, ac accept that sort of rugged use over time. So we're looking at, we just recently created a series of urban wetlands that start to make sure that the water as it gets to the bay is clean water. We've started to create great places that are just for locals alone to use to enjoy the romance of being at the waterfront and enjoy their city. We're making sure that every nook and cranny is safe at night so that they're well-lit, great places that you don't feel uh, are a hazard to be in at night, so that they're all illuminated well and part of a future legacy. The uh, playground in Southern California is another story. This is one, one that shares a lot of uh, attributes that your city has. It's also host to a Grand Prix on the waterfront. And as we know, one of the struggles with that is to be able to host the, the setup and the takedown and all the things that happen in between and turning something that wants to be intimate and pedestrian friendly into something that is really auto-centric. So we understand the complexity of how those relationships work. And a lot of it means that at the fine grain level, you're looking at those special places that have got nothing to do with the Grand Prix, but they're all embedded into the Grand Prix and those heavy, robust events that you have on the waterfront here. So there we looked at creating, for instance, a picnic hill so that you could get up and away from things. You could also use the hillside to be up looking out over the harbor and the waterfront. So we used landform to change things. We created inland uh, artificial beaches where there was no beach, where there was just a muddy lagoon but most important, we built everything with robust materials that could withstand a Grand Prix and we could withstand the abuse, quite frankly, of big events and last 100 years on the waterfront. So when we think of implementation here, there's a cost associated with waterfront because you're creating the land, you're holding back the land and the ocean, and uh, we need to make sure whatever we design, we're comfortable with and we're going to keep it for 50 to 100 or 200 years because that's how long things at the waterfront need to last. And I think you already see that in the legacy of your waterfront. Um, I've had the joy of working in Baltimore in a harbor. Again, a great framework that began many, many years ago with Jim Rouse when he went to the waterfront. But the success of the waterfront there is what taught us that the, the plan for what was in the water was what drove the land. Before Jim Rouse built all the retail on the waterfront, they put out a leasing plan for the docks in the water for the dinner boats, the excursion boats, the historic boats, and those got sold out overnight and it got people interested in the waterfront and only then was the retail at the waterfront successful. So it was this idea of creating something in the water that was unique and an attraction for that edge. We're working in Long Beach, we're working in San Pedro for the city of LA to create a waterfront up against what some people might see as a pretty nasty environment, a working port. But actually the people in San Pedro, when you spoke to the people in the village, the town, that's what they loved. Their, their joy was to see this big machine at work and what they didn't have was the opportunity to get up, up and close and see it. So we des designed a series of great little pocket parks like this one with native vegetation right at the shoreline, as close as you could possibly get and it's just magnificent to see the big boats move in and out or to have an event at the waterfront. And then we complemented that with neighborhood parks that led you inland and created some fun and excitement for locals like this musical fountain. 
um, and we designed a plan with the port so that they could really host within the working harbor great events and great festivals. This is just last week uh, when we had the uh, tour ships visiting and we were able to create something that was fun and romantic and exciting for locals within a working harbor. So never say and nothing's impossible because a long time ago the port would have said, sorry, we can't do this, it's our operating port, but today we have rubber ducks uh, out in the harbor. Um, we created simple places to get information about the waterfront, so great graphics and wayfinding and signage that told you and instructed you about the waterfront. A great story where we actually took all the letters of the alphabet that get used in navigation terms and we explained what they meant so kids could walk around with their grandfathers who were mariners and get told a great story about the waterfront. San Francisco, we used the, uh, the opportunity of uh, as a catalytic event hosting the America's Cup to rebuild some old infrastructure and some old piers on the waterfront. It's something the city could never have afforded to do just to rebuild them because the, the, the economy was not there, but the fact that they were hosting uh, the America's Cup in a couple of years drove the plan and moved things forward. So we want to look for those opportunities here to do some things that maybe you couldn't afford by driving the plan with some great catalytic events and projects. Or we just want to enhance what you already have. Some really beautiful parks that get to the water's edge, maybe inch them up a little bit, notch them up a little bit so that they uh, truly are jewels and gems at the waterfront at every opportunity. This is on the Brisbane River, uh, Brisbane waterfront, where we've created some beautiful parks and amphitheaters for events. They don't look like they're empty when there's no event because you take a deck chair and you go and sit in it and enjoy it on Tuesday, but these actually host with river barges, big concerts out in the water and people sit on the lawns and enjoy them or great new swimming pools and water taxis that take people around. We think we really need to do a lot to connect the inside, inland parks with some great activities. This is a local park that is a, accepts stormwater from the streets and cleans the stormwater in wet, wetlands that have been created within the park before it returns it to the water system, what we call a working water system uh, in Los Angeles. And then we should think about some of the streets that are very traffic oriented, they're very wide streets right at the waterfront, lots of parking, lots of wide intersections, pretty inhospitable on a hot day uh, to navigate, but there's no reason that when the evening cools down, we could manage them very differently and simply put a tie across them or bollard them so that in the evenings, the art museum can open up to a great event on the waterfront and just use it as their front door. Uh, which right now they don't have. They have a beginning of a front door facing out to the bay, but there's no reason we couldn't just say at six o'clock every evening when there's no traffic, it's gonna become our evening festival, strolling or party event street on the waterfront. Um, it needs to be a great address for everyone, so you can do wonderful things. This is a, I love showing this image because this is what everybody thinks Lower Manhattan doesn't look like, but actually this is Battery Park, Sydney, just off uh, World Trade Centers. It's only 50 feet wide and it's become the postcard image of the city. And I think you should think about as you do these walking tours, every opportunity to have a great postcard image for your neighborhood along the waterfront. So when you start sending us those emails and photos, that's what we're looking for is what you think the postcard image should be like. Similarly, Vancouver's new waterfront, some of the iconic buildings out on a pier. Pier buildings can be very lightweight and, and like lanterns out in the water. This is a beautiful one that was built for the Rugby World Cup uh, in Auckland, so we're thinking of working very closely with what the language is of buildings and new rooftops and along the waterfront so they have a beautiful glowing softer feel at the waterfront rather than some heavy uh, chunky uh, buildings. And there are lots of ways that can be done. Nighttime lighting, we all know this great jewel, this is out on a pier in the waterfront, so there's no reason not to think, think big in some instances. But there's also opportunities we think for sort of, sort of charming waterfront edges and right now you have no restaurants that really you can sit at a deck. There's one restaurant on the corner uh, on the way out to the pier. Uh, but we think there should be lots of opportunity to have cafe tables right at the edge and really enjoy that opportunity and, and to host special events and again light them up beautifully at night so that your town takes a different form at night uh, as it becomes twilight or dusk. Um, and just to remember that you know you're on the world map. You're not just St. Pete, you have the opportunity to really become a window, uh, offer a window into your world to the rest of the rest of the world. So in summary, um, as we have our conversations later this evening and then the walking tours and the, the, the meetings we have and workshops we have with you, we're going to be 
testing this idea of a water plan, of what you think the water activities should be like, so whether that's swimming or whether that's boating or that's dining at the waterfront and water's edge. Remembering those linkages, it was great that everybody put their star on the map or their, their circle on the map. I would love everybody who didn't walk here tonight, which I'm sure is probably 99% of you, to really feel like you could walk here. Although the, the downturn was pretty heavy with dots in there, so maybe I'm wrong. Maybe 60% of you did walk here from work. But we'd love people to think of this as a great walking, pedestrian-friendly, great linkages, upland. Um, and then this contiguous public realm. We saw a lot of green dots, green spaces on the first map I showed you. We'd love to be able to draw a map of the city that is just a beautiful green swath that's connected, all connected throughout uh, the water's edge. And in order to do this, we have to realize added value. There has to be an ability to pay for everything at the end of the day. So we are going to be looking for opportunities where we can get cafes at the waterfront or add more marina space. There needs to be some added value that's realizable not only uh, from the beauty and, 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 and livability aspects, but from a financial point of view for the city, we hope. And we should not shy away from you know, taking what is today, quite frankly, a wild waterfront and thinking about what's the wild waterfront that we want to own and, and love and cherish for the next generation. So I hope those are some ins good inspiration and talking points. As I said, we're not going to be like any of those. We really want to know what's unique from you today and what you expect to see. So this is, we need to have a big vision, but we want to get down to actionable items as we move forward into the next phase. I hope that the nine months bears fruit and we've got some shovels in the ground as soon after as we can. Thank you. With that, I'm going to <laughs> hand off to Dave Barth. So I'm David Barth with AACOM and I specialize in parks planning. And in a couple of minutes, we're gonna be asking you to do our first group exercise where we start talking about planning for the waterfront. And I've long held this theory in parks and recreation planning that we don't have a common language to talk about parks and recreation spaces. A couple of months ago, I was asked to present at a conference of parks planners, landscape architects, and parks and rec professionals. I decided to test my theory so I did a very scientific experiment. I emailed six of my closest friends in parks planning and landscape architecture um, and uh, engineering and, and uh, uh, park design. And I asked them to define a couple of words. So one word I asked them to define was the word program. And I went in the back. I can't tell what you guys can see back there. Can you read that slide? So if you look at that, you know, the planners said, well, a program is a specific plan. And the landscape architect said, oh, no, no, the program or the elements, that's the stuff we're designing on the site. And the parks and rec professionals said, oh, no, the program or the activities we're providing. So, you know, I had my first confirmation of my hypothesis that maybe we use different languages. So I'm going to test some stuff on you. So the first thing I want you to think of is if I say the word playground, get an image in your mind. What do you think of when I say the word playground? <laughs> St. Petersburg is, is the entire city. So for a lot of you, it may look something like that. Is that fairly clear to a lot of folks? Is that what you thought of? But then for others of you, you know, it may look like that. And so the question is, should we be saying the word playground, or should we be saying places for our kids to play? So I'll give you another one. If I say basketball court, think in your mind basketball court. You ready? So, so a lot of you, especially parks and rec professionals, would immediately say this, that's a basketball court. But a place to play basketball and hang out might look like that. Very much different than a basketball court. This is a much more urban setting. This has got economic implications. This is just a great place to hang out and play basketball or watch people play basketball. So I'll give you one more. If I say the word dog park, you ready? Think of dog park? All right, so many of you will think about that, but how many of you thought about that? So, so I haven't determined what to name that yet. I think that may be dog box. I don't, I don't know what the term is yet. So the idea is how do we develop a common language beginning with tonight so we can talk about parks, open space, and the waterfront. And there's two big ideas I have that I'd like to share with you. The first one is that we quit talking about facilities 
which is very narrowing, like basketball court, playground. Instead, we talk about experiences and activities. So when you do your exercise tonight and going forward for the rest of the master plan, can you keep going back to talking about the experience that you want to have rather than zeroing in on the specific design of a facility to get that experience? Does that make sense to everybody? Because it's the experience we're after. And there's tons of different ways to design for those experiences. So for example, these are the kinds of experiences that most of us want in walking distance for our home. I want to be able to walk the dog. I want to be able to take a walk with my spouse or my, uh, uh, my best friend. I want to sunbathe or picnic or throw a frisbee, whatever. And these are the kinds of experiences people generally want outside their neighborhood that they're willing to travel to, a concert, a class, a special event. Does that make sense? So that's what I'm calling an activities-based framework or an experience-based framework. So that's one set of ideas as we go forward. Talk, when we talk about the spaces along the waterfront and what we do there, let's talk about experiences and activities. The second part deals with the benefits that we want to derive for the community from those spaces. So it goes above and beyond the activities and experiences and says, well, what do we want to generate for the rest of the community from the waterfront? And in the work that I'm doing at the University of Florida, we're terming these high-performance public spaces. The idea that we have public spaces that generate economic, social, and environmental benefits. What's happening in parks and recreation, and I don't know if you can read those words, is that through the years, parks and open spaces are being asked to do a lot more than they used to be asked to do. So they're not just places to play, they're also being asked to generate revenues to pay for operations and maintenance. They're being asked to be the places where the community comes together, where we have social equity and social diversity. So there's all kinds of things they're being asked to do. They're being asked to improve your water quality. So we should talk about the benefits we get. The mayor spoke at the, I guess, the Vinoy Club a couple months ago, um, and these were some of the issues he mentioned or some of the challenges going on in the city. So when we talk about the waterfront, in addition to activi activities and experiences, can we talk about the benefits that can be generated from the waterfront that may address some of those issues? Now, I know you can't re -see, re read this slide from the back, so I went and checked. But what this says is when we're talking about benefits, think about social benefits, think about equity, think about uh, places for the community to come together. Think about environmental benefits, things like uh, sea rise levels, things like heat island effect, things like wildlife habitat. Think about the things that we may be able to do, water quality, that we can improve the environment. And talk about economic benefits. Are there opportunities to create jobs? Are there opportunities to increase property values? So in addition to, again, thinking about activities and experiences, if we can think about benefits, then I think we have this great one-two punch. So experiences or activities, plus the benefits that we generate, create what we're terming a high-performance public waterfront. And I think that's one of the, the goals of the project. So with that, I'll turn it over to Pete to talk about our exercise, and thank you very much. Thank you. So that was a lot of stuff, but we felt like it was important for you to have a sense of how we are thinking about our approach to this project and our commitment to have a real dialogue with you about it. Um, and understand what you want your waterfront to be. So what we'd like to do um, is for the remainder of the evening, you know, say maybe the next 30 minutes or so, we would like to just start at a very, very high level and ask three basic questions. So on every table is a sheet that looks like this. And um, we really have three questions. And we're happy to have you talk as a table about these three questions, but before you leave, we want you to actually write down your, what's in your heart about the waterfront, not what the table consensus necessarily was. So I think some discussion is good, but ultimately we want to know individually where you are about, about your aspirations for the waterfront. So we want you to do two things. We want you to write down anything that you have to say about what is your vision for the waterfront and that could be a big vision or it could be a specific a specific issue at a specific location we want to know what you hope this waterfront master plan will achieve 
And we want to know what you want to make sure this waterfront master plan doesn't achieve. Is there, some, is there an outcome that you want to make sure that we don't somehow end up at an outcome that would be, that would be counter to your idea about the future of St. Petersburg? So we want you to write those down. At the end of the evening, we're going to pick them all up. We're going to type them all up. We're going to catalog them. They're going to be on the Mind Mixer page. The ones that are mentioned the most are going to be, you know, we're going to quantify what types of things have come up the most. But the reason for the stickies is we want you to look at your list and maybe write down the top one or two things and put them on the corresponding color on one of the boards in the room. And I think what we can do is sort of a little social exercise here is as you get ready to leave tonight, put up your sticky, but also look at some of the other stickies that are up and see what some of your peers are talking about in terms of their aspirations, their, their hopes and dreams, as well as maybe their fears about um, what, what we want to make sure that we don't accomplish on the plan. So what I want to do is give you, about, give you about 20 minutes or so to look at these questions and start to work on them. And then, um, and then we'll try to go to the stickies and have you start putting things up on the stickies and then we'll, we'll wrap for the evening. Okay, fair enough? Everybody good with that? Okay, great, thank you.